One of the boys just returned from a week-long Levita trip in the Adirondacks. Levita, I imagine many of you are familiar with it here at Grace Chapel, is run by Gordon College, but Levita is not for the faint of heart. For example, one of the more challenging parts of the trip, mentally and spiritually, more than physically, is a 24-hour solo. Well, in preparation for the hike, we had to do some shopping. We wound our way to the Kittery Outlets, where we met Dylan, a lovely young man, a sales clerk uh, at a retail store that stocked the equipment and apparel that we needed. Dylan was an experienced hiker, more than 1,800 miles each year. Unlike us, he knew what he was talking about, and he knew the Adirondacks. He said to our son, you're going to have fun, but it'll be type two fun. And of course I said, what's type two fun? He explained first that type one fun was fun in the moment, but type two fun wasn't necessarily fun in the moment at all. But with type two fun, you'd come home with some really good stories. So Sam definitely had type two fun, and at times I think maybe he had type three fun. When the vans were returning home from the trip, Rich and I rendezvoused at Gordon College, and uh, Sam exited and he approached us. Now I was recording the whole thing on my phone, and I think he could tell that I wanted to linger and talk to some of the other campers and the parents because I got the look. You know the one. He got within earshot and the first words out of his mouth were, let's go home. There's something about home and when you've been away from it, enduring grueling conditions, you just want to get back home. Do you know what it's like to want to come home? Maybe you can remember as a little boy or girl going off to camp for the first time and craving home. Or maybe you're a parent and you know what it's like to vacation with your kids and by the end of vacation, you just want to get home. You want to sleep in your own bed. Or maybe some change in your life has taken place and you've moved out of your home into a place that's not really quite home yet and there are days when you miss your home. Do you know what it's like to yearn for home? In our passage today, the Israelites are far away from home. They're living in exile. They just want to go home. You see, a new world leader has taken the stage. Nebuchadnezzar is his name. And over the course of two decades or so, Nebuchadnezzar embarks on a series of at least four sieges of Jerusalem and uh, sieges and deportations of the people of Judah. He begins with the deportation of Israel's brightest young men. You know the story. Daniel, his friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. That was around 605 BC. But our passage takes place soon after the siege and deportation of many Israelites around 598, 597 BC. Nebuchadnezzar allows a king to remain on the throne in Jerusalem but more Israelites will be taken to Babylon about 10 years from that point, 586, when the temple is utterly destroyed. But for now, the Israelites have not been long in captivity. And Jeremiah, the prophet who's living in Jerusalem still, writes them the letter that we find in Jeremiah chapter 29. They desperately want to go home, but they're receiving mixed messages about returning home. A group of prophets living in exile with them are telling them they'll be going home soon. But Jeremiah the prophet, still residing in Jerusalem, is telling them, no, they won't. Do the exiles listen to what their hearts and itching ears desperately want to hear about going home, or do they listen? Do they listen to the word of God? Do they listen to the word of God about going home? 
Would you turn with me in your Bibles to Jeremiah chapter 29? Jeremiah chapter 29, beginning in verse 1. This is the text of the letter that the prophet Jeremiah sent from Jerusalem to the surviving elders among the exiles and to the priests, the prophets, and all the other people Nebuchadnezzar had carried into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. This was after King Jehoiakim and the queen mother, the court officials and the leaders of Judah and Jerusalem, the skilled workers and the artisans had gone into exile from Jerusalem. He entrusted the letter to Elisah, son of Shaphan, and to Gamariah, son of Hilkiah, whom Zedekiah, king of Judah, sent to King Nebuchadnezzar in Babylon. It said, This is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says to all those I carried into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. Build houses and settle down. Plant gardens and eat what they produce. Marry and have sons and daughters. Find wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage, so that they too may have sons and daughters. Increase in number there. Do not decrease. Also seek the peace and prosperity of the city, to which I have carried you into exile. Pray to the Lord for it, because if it prospers, you too will prosper." Yes, this is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says. Do not let the prophets and diviners among you deceive you. Do not listen to the dreams you encourage them to have. They are prophesying lies to you in my name. I have not sent them, declares the Lord. This is what the Lord says. When 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will come to you and fulfill my good promise to bring you back to this place. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. Then you will call on me and come and pray to me, and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. I will be found by you, declares the Lord and will bring you back from captivity. I will gather you from all the nations and places where I have banished you, declares the Lord, and will bring you back to the place from which I carried you into exile." Well, this is the word of the Lord. You see, the false prophets told the exiles what they wanted to hear. The exiles wanted to believe that captivity would be short. You're going to see that in the verses uh, following, beginning in verse 15. So the people in exile, they had left home. They, they had left their homes. They had left businesses. They left friends and relatives. They left the temple, the center of worship. Everything was gone. They were forced out of the lives they had made in God, God's promised land. God's promised land. <laughs> they were being forcefully removed from the land God promised to Abraham and his descendants. What did their captivity say about their adherence to the covenant? What did their captivity say about God? Was God really true to his promises that the promised land would be theirs? Can you imagine the thoughts that ran through their heads, the sad songs they sang, the conversations they had? Surely this was just a bump in the road. It would be short. And there were people, leaders, prophets, willing to tell the people what they wanted to hear. Prophets said, yes, the time will be short. And they told the exiles that the temple was still standing. And it was true. The temple was still standing. And it was intact. But if you know your ancient Bible history, you know that within a decade, Nebuchadnezzar would lay siege to Jerusalem again and utterly destroy it. Then the false prophets told the people that, hey, a king is still reigning on the throne in Jerusalem. It won't be long. And that was true. Nebuchadnezzar put King Zedekiah on the throne, but that wouldn't last long either. So those things were true. And the exiles, because of those things, could see a path home. They just needed their Babylonian captors to be overthrown so they could leave. Some leaders love telling people 
what they want to hear, even when it's not true. Hard to believe. Well, there's always someone ready to take advantage, even exploit the de desires of your heart. Maybe it's a particular leader or politician coming to your mind. Maybe a particular industry comes to mind. But it is true that some leaders love telling people what they want to hear, even when it's not true. But in this passage, we're not talking about politicians or industries. It's the prophets, the religious leaders, who are telling people what they want to hear, even when it's not true. But religious leaders can't be in the business of telling people what they want to hear. Faith leaders ne need to tell people what God actually says. It's not about what we want to hear. It's about what God wants to say. And that's where Jeremiah the prophet steps in. And he writes a letter to the exiles in Babylon telling them not what they are aching to hear, but what God actually says. Do you know what that's like? You have in mind what you want to hear from God. Maybe you want him to say your time in grief or depression won't be long. Relief is right around the corner. Or maybe you want him to say that love is just around the corner or reconciliation in a rocky relationship is only moments away. Or you want to hear that your kids are totally normal, typically developing. The thing is, when we live into what we want to hear over what God actually says, then we begin to make decisions. And those decisions turn around and they make us. If we want to hear that grief won't be long, then we might cut corners in the grieving process. If we want to hear that love is just around the corner, then we might not wait for who God has planned for us or never find joy in singleness. If we want to hear that reconciliation is coming to a strained relationship right away, then we might not put the effort, effort required to truly make peace. If we want to hear that our kids are typically developing, then we might miss the wonderful ways that God has made them beautiful and unique and the wonderful ways in which he wants to work in us. If the exiles believed that a return to Jerusalem was imminent, then they would probably live life differently. It's likely that they wouldn't lay down roots in their new city. They might not get to know their neighbors. In fact, they'd probably hope for the demise of their neighbors because that would be the quickest way out of captivity if Babylon is destroyed. So you see what I'm saying? If they're going to believe only what they want to hear, they might make decisions based on that. If our family goes away for a short amount of time, let's say a weekend or one or two nights, I don't really unpack my suitcase. But if we go away for more than five nights, I move into the hotel drawers. I get comfortable. I put down roots. I explore. I get to know the hotel staff. If the exiles believe the time is short, then they won't engage in the culture or the arts or the language of their new city. They're not going to pray for the people. They're only going to wish for their demise. The false prophets were telling the exiles what they wanted to hear, that they'd be home soon. And the exiles were in danger of living life according to what they wanted to hear and not according to what God actually said. But Jeremiah told the exiles not what they wanted to hear, but what they needed to hear, which was what God said, the truth. He told them that the exile was God's initiation. If you take a look at verse 4, chapter 29, this is what he says. This is what the Lord Almighty the God of Israel says to all those I carried into exile from Jerusalem, Jerusalem to Babylon. You see that? This is what the Lord God Almighty, the God of Israel says to all those I carried into exile. Yeah, God used the Babylonians, but God brought the Israelites into exile. 
out of the promised land because they did not keep his covenant. This was God's doing. This is a hard truth. They had followed after other gods and they routinely practiced injustice. They had broken the covenant. So God sent them into exile. Yeah, it was the first hard truth the Israelites needed to hear. But there's more. Then Jeremiah tells them that the prophets in Babylon were lying to them. They were indeed false prophets. The prophets were only telling them what they wanted to hear. The hard truth was that exile would last 70 years. Uh, Take a look right here at verse 10. This is what the Lord says. When 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will come to you and fulfill my good promise to bring you back to this place. Yes, the temple was still standing in Jerusalem and a king was still on the throne. But all of that was going to change. That was a hard truth the Israelites needed to hear. Exile would last 70 years. And it would be 70 long years. But there are more hard truths (laughs) that they needed to hear. If they understood and believed that truth, that uh, exile was really coming from God, it was his initiative, that it would last 70 years, believing that truth would affect the way the Israelites lived in Babylon. And this is what we get in verses 5 to 7. Instead of not laying down roots and not getting to know the culture or one's neighbors or even praying for their demise, God said the exiles should build houses and live in them. They should plant gardens. It's going to take a while if you're going to eat from them. They should marry, have children. God is telling them to lay down roots in that heathen land. God doesn't tell them to adopt all of their ways, but he talks of a way in which they can live in that land. Then he tells the exiles to look outside of their own homes and gardens and families. He says, look to the Babylonians. God tells the exiles to pray for their peace and prosperity. Let's take a look. Verse 11, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. He says, Then you will call on me and come and pray to me, and I will listen to you. Before this, he tells the Israelites in verse 7, Seek the peace and prosperity of the city to which I have carried you into exile. Pray to the Lord for it, because if it prospers, you too will prosper. Yes, God tells the exiles to pray for the peace and prosperity of the city that is holding them captive. I don't know how you can have peace without relationship. God wants them to build relationships, to pray for the prosperity of the city, because if the city does well, then all of the the inhabitants will do well, even the exiles. God wants the exiles to do business with their enemies. He wants them to appreciate all that's good in the Babylonians' culture, the art and the architecture, the music, the language. Enjoy the beauty and productivity of this fertile land. Make a difference for good, for God in the city you now live. Maybe you will even win some of your Babylonian neighbors over. Jeremiah tells the exiles the truth, and it's very different than the lies of the false prophets. And believing the truth would affect how they lived in Babylon. Did they pray for their neighbor's demise or for their prosperity? Did they keep to themselves or did they make friends with their neighbors? Did they appreciate what was good in their culture or did they scorn everything? Did they make a difference where they lived and win their neighbors over? Jeremiah told them the truth. Exile was from God because of their disobedience. Exile would last a long 70 years. The Israelites should make roots in enemy land. But there's more truth to be told. Exile was punishment, but it was meant to turn the hearts of the people back to God. Maybe you remember being sent to your room as a little kid or placed in time out. Sometimes your parents put you there just to cool you down 
Everybody needed space. But God didn't say to the Israelites, you've done something wrong. Cool off. We just need space for a time. Punishment should lead to repentance. If the exiles sought God, he would hear them and bring them back to the promised land. That was the truth they needed to hear. When they sought God, he would hear them, no matter what they had done. That's an important truth for us today too. No matter what we have done, when we turn to God, he always answers. He never says, that was the last time. He never says, oh, it's you again. When we seek him with all of our heart, God answers. The exiles needed to know that even though they had been sent from the promised land by God because of their disobedience, God has not rejected them forever. Yeah, 70 years is a long time, but it is not forever. That's why God says in this beloved, most often searched verse, second most often searched verse, verse 11, I know the plans I have for you. Plans not to harm you, but to give you a hope and a future, a hopeful future. What God is saying here is, Exile won't last forever. I know the plans. You may think it lasts forever, it's going to last forever, but God has a good plan to restore them. God is saying 70 years is a long time, but seek me in exile with all your heart, and I have a future full of hope waiting for you. I have not rejected you forever. So here's the question. Will the people in exile listen to Jeremiah's word the word of the Lord. And if they do, will they live according to God's truth? Will they build houses? Will they seek peace? You can't do it long distance. It requires relationship. Will they engage in what is good in the culture, the language, the arts? Will they help to make it better? Will they participate in making the city prosper? God says if they do, because they live there, they'll partake in that prosperity. The Israelites have a decision to make. They can listen to the false prophets, and believe a lie, that lie would affect the way they lived in that world. No relationships fostering hate in the land they now lived, no appreciation of culture, and most importantly, no repentance. They could harden their hearts, or they could listen to the truth and settle down in the land, pray for the peace and prosperity of its inhabitants, make a name for God in that land. They could repent and have their hearts melted and changed and after a long duration, come home. Charles Haddon Spurgeon, an English preacher in the 1800s, preached on Jeremiah and remarked that the same sun both melts the wax and hardens the clay. How would the exiles hear God's word to them? Would it melt their hearts and turn them back to him? Or would it harden their hearts and cause destruction? Isn't it strange how we can hear the same words, the same word of God, but sometimes our hearts are melted and other times we dig our heels in and our hearts are hardened. The exiles ended up seeking God. They regained a heart for him. Even in the pain of the duration and the difficulty of the distance, they sought him because they knew God was good for his promises. They turned to the Torah. They learned it. They learned it well, and they sought God with all their hearts. They trusted that God would bring them back home. And he did. He brought them back home. For the Israelites, the duration was long and the distance was far, but God answered them when they sought him with all their hearts. This is a truth for us as well. When we seek God with all our hearts, even when the duration is long and the distance is far, he brings us home to a future full of hope because it's a future with him. Maybe the time has been long and the distance too, but seek God. He could be using the pain of the duration and the difficulty of the dis distance to bring you back to him, to bring you closer to him so you can embrace a hopeful future in Jesus Christ. Mullen Lowe is not your traditional communications agency. It was launched in Bogota, Colombia in the 1990s. They'd hoped to become one of the most creative companies in existence. They contracted with Colombia's Ministry of Defense with the goal of reaching rebel guerrillas, FARC, remember, 
who achieve their purposes through kidnapping, extortion, murder, and drug trafficking. The goal of this communications agency was to persuade guerrilla members of FARC to leave the conflict and reunite with their families to go home. Mung and Lo did some research and they discovered that during the Christmas season, there was an uptick in the number of guerrillas who left the jungle to go home. That was a season when these rebels uh, missed home. So the agency developed a Christmas campaign that spanned four years. The first year of the campaign, they decided to decorate and light trees throughout the jungle to remind the guerrillas of home. Christmas came to FARC. 30% more guerrillas came home that year. The next year of the Christmas campaign, the agency focused on miners who had been recruited by FARC. During the Christmas season, they sent messages in bottles that were sealed and lighted, and they sent them down the river into the jungle, inviting these young guerrillas to come back home. More young people deserted the jungle than in previous years, and overall, one guerrilla left the jungle every six hours for the months of December and January. They went home. In the third year of the Christmas campaign, Mullen Lo discovered that members of FARC, they loved soccer, just as much as their Colombian counterparts in the cities and the countryside. So the communications agency got hold of actual mothers of these rebel members. They placed ads during the soccer games in which these mothers held pictures of their son or daughter who now lived in the jungle, asking them, Please come home for Christmas. In the final year of the campaign, the agency realized that most families would welcome their rebel sons and daughters back home. But what about the rest of the communities, the rest of the people living in these communities? FARC had re reached, wreaked havoc across the country. The rebels feared they would not be welcomed by their communities. So the agency reached out to ordinary Colombian citizens. They video recorded messages from ordinary citizens who said, come home, we want you back, please come home. Over the four years of the Christmas campaign, more than 18,000 rebels left the conflict. They went home. How do you get back home after you've really messed up. The Israelites desperately wanted to go home after they had sinned. So they sought God with all their heart. God brought them home to a future filled with hope, a future with him. God too had a creative and extraordinary Christmas campaign. He looked at all of the people he created some had been away from him for a long time. Some had gone as far as you think a person could possibly go from God. But no matter how long the duration, how far the distance, God made this Christmas campaign to bring people home. It began softly in a manger crescendoed at the cross, and culminated at the empty tomb. That is God's campaign to bring people home to enjoy a hope and a future in Him. Perhaps you feel like you're distant from God today. You're living in exile from the faith you once knew and cherished. Maybe you think you're as far as a person could possibly go from God. Or maybe you're just mildly distant from God, but you've got him at arm's length, but you know that you're really not at home until you're at home with him. You wonder how you might get home to God. Here it is. Jeremiah says it. He says, seek God with all your heart and he will bring you home into his presence to enjoy a hope in a future with him. When you seek God with all your heart, he will bring you home to a hope-filled future with him, no matter where you are or where you've been, no matter the distance or the duration, when you seek him with all your heart, he will bring you home to a hope-filled future with him. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. 
plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you a hope and a future. Call on his name. Please pray with me. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. Help us to listen to it, Lord, and help us to ignore those false voices all around us. Even when these truths are hard, God, help us to hear you. And Lord, show us again and again that coming home to you is the only place where we can find a hope and a future. In Jesus' name, amen.